Hey, what's up, everyone? I am Sponjik, and I'm here today with a brand new video. This will be my comeback video after about a month or so of being gone. Now, I've been very busy with schoolwork, but now I'm free. The uh, winter or Christmas holidays are right around the corner, and I've been spending the last uh, weekend doing a lot of research to have a lot of videos prepared just to record. Now, that's all that's going to be done recording them. So, this is the first one. It'll be about a very cool species, which is Brumicaria brunea. It's a species I've never actually owned, but I've had a very close friend who did, and I've been doing a lot of research on them because I'm going to keep them, not right now, but maybe someday. Now, this end species comes from Southeast Asia, especially, or more precisely, India and Malaysia. They come from very closed forests, and closed forests mean that it's very hard to, for a human to pass through them because the trees are very much close together and that would mean that small and social insects like ants have a very uh, up top predatory state inside. This would also mean that they like um, very humid and hot conditions. They are already tropical which should make the, them a very humid and hot uh, condition loving ant species and they're also from very close forests. And in those, in those coast forests, the humidity is very high. What that does, uh, other than make the ants like even higher humidity, is make it so that fluctuation of temperature happens very much uh, less often and in a very much more slow uh, sort of effect. So over the day and over the week and over the year, the temperature doesn't fluctuate as much as anywhere else. What that means is that they're very picky when it comes to humidity and temperature. So, the numbers I'll throw at you, of course, you should watch my video about how to proper, regu properly re regulate an ant species temperature and humidity and how to give them a break. Basically, the numbers I'll give you are that they need humidity anywhere above 50, from 50% to 100%. Their sweet spot would be somewhere around 55 to 75, somewhere around those would be just perfect for them. So 70% humidity, uh, 60 something. Did I say 55? I meant 60, so their sweet spot would be around 65 to 75. So 70 would be just the little perfect humidity for them. Of course, you shouldn't give them one humidity, you should give them a gradient. How do you know the humidity inside the nest is? Or what it is, you just give them a humidity outside and hum humidify the nest, which would mean that the nest is always more humid than the outside, which is how they want that to be. And also, uh, well, not necessarily. They they do come from a place where sometimes you want they want their nest to be drier than the outside because don't really, they don't really want a hundred percent humidity inside the nest. But you don't want that hundred percent humidity outside either. So what you want to do is have the, the humidity outside be lower, the humidity inside be high. And that way you can make sure that you're giving them a proper gradient. And by the way, check out my video, that will explain it a lot better than I can in these few minutes. Now let's get on to temperature. Temperature, they are also very picky, but they can sustain themselves at anywhere between 21 and 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, however, they do thrive a lot better in temperatures between 22 and 24. That's a two degree a space to work with. Well, three, actually, 22, 23, 24. But still, it's a very narrow um, limit, which is hard to maintain. But if you can, it would be f perfect for this ant colony. Now, when it comes to their sizes, that gets a little bit interesting because the queen, especially when compared to the workers, she is pretty big. She's somewhere around 12, 13 millimeters long, while the workers are only from 55 millimeters to 8 millimeters. Now they are a little bit polymorph, which means that there will be small workers and big workers all throughout the same colony. They don't have really a soldier cast and a worker cast, but they do have some little differences which are always cool to see, I guess. I don't mind them not existing, I like them when they do, and I think almost all innkeepers 
think this way, so it's a bonus. Now when it comes to the actual colony size of the colony, they are monogenous, but still they can get to about 10,000 workers, though they thought that, that's, that doesn't really happen a lot in captivity. They really do appreciate to have the, the big space that they have in the forest. They, they form trails that can be over 40 meters long and they usually do it underground, so you probably can't have those conditions for the ants, but they will thrive in captivity, especially in man-made setups, which is weird considering what I've just said, but if they don't have the tendency to build, they just have the tendency to be occupying something and they're thriving there, they won't feel the need to build as much and they'll thrive better than giving them a limited natural setup. This is a, one of those special little snowflakes where a natural setup is not the best option unless you can give them an entire room of your house and basically never see the colony again. Which you don't want to do, so you know, don't. No, 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 don't. So, here's the thing in the wild, uh, they have very interesting behaviors, and that is why you would want to keep them. And to understand that, let's first understand what they eat. They don't eat anything special, however, they depend solely on the honeydew for uh, carbohydrates in their diet. And you can't really go around and taking little droplets of honeydew from bugs, from bugs butts all around your area and give them to your ants. And after a while you can you can get them used to eating honey or sugar water, or sugar honey water, whatever you want to call it. But that will be very hard to do in the beginning. And in the beginning, what you should do is feed them insects and meats, which they eat a lot of. They eat insects and meats and honeydew. You should feed them insects and meats, which contain a lot of fat, because fat can be metabolized for energy just like carbohydrates. So they are, they, they, it is a good substitute for the honeydew to be fat insects, like uh, superworms, mealworms, those are very fatty insects. Uh, they're not fatty compared to any other sort of meats that we consume, but they are very fatty for an insect, which is almost fully just protein. protein. Now, given that they have such strict diets, and given that they live in a place where any ant colony is a superpower, they have to contend with other ant colonies for food. Now, they have developed some behaviors, and first of all, they're fierce. They're just amazing to, uh, to, when it comes to fighting, to defend their food territory, and ant caps, the, 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 the honeydew bugs that they protect, and move around and take care of, which they do, and that's amazing to watch. They have uh, that same posture of the chromatograph species. They have, though, that raised abdomen that would shoot a formic acid out, and they spray it around and being a, a little bit bigger than any chromatogaster colony or well any chromatogaster species you will actually see the little bubble of formic acid forming in the tip of their abdomen when you piss them off which you shouldn't so don't but if you do you will see the little bit the little droplet of formic acid on the tip of the ant butt also called gaster from you know chromatogaster the, well, here's another cool defense mechanism. They build anthills with the material that they excavate to create their nests. And then those, those anthills are not just piled up dirt, they are as, as much, well, compacted as much as, a, as an ant can do it. So they are very good defend, defend, defensive structures against other ants, which have a very hard time during digging and drilling through the condensed dirt. Now they often have to contend territories with Phytogenid affinis and Phytogenid diversa, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, I'll talk about the differences of, between Phytogenid affinis and Phytogenid diversa in a video that I'll be making soon, because I've actually got them wrong and, and, and I actually understood them wrong for the longest time. My, my video on Carabia diversa is actually talking about Carvera affinis and I didn't even know. 
Well, I know now, and I'm going to rectify that in a few days or weeks, whatever. I don't know. Well, they do. Uh, be they have become very fierce over their evolution, and they have become little fighting machines. Even though they don't stink, and that their spray can't really hurt you, they are fierce, and they're very cool to watch. Also, about them building anthills, they do it even in a man-made setup. So if you have a nest connected to an outwell, they'll build a little anthill on the entrance for the tube inside the outwell. So you have to keep that in mind and give them the barrier that would keep them uh, inside, that would make sure that they don't build above the barrier and get out. One thing of importance as well is that they like to climb trees a lot, to find their little mealybugs and whatever is feeding them honeydew. So they are very good climbers. What you have to keep in mind today is that vertical barriers of PTFE will not do jack. You have to use upside down horizontal PTFE barriers. So a lip all around your outworld with some PTFE will do the trick. Baby powder, they're small enough to cross it, uh, but they're not big enough to where PTFE is not viable. So. If they were very big, they could just, you know, stretch and get to the other side of the PTFE. You'd have to use a lot of it. They're not very big. Use PTFE. Don't make, make sure that you can't build out of the setup. They don't really chew that well, so digging through anywhere to get out is not an option. I wouldn't call them exactly escape artists. I'd call them great climbers, which they are. So keep that in mind. Give them everything they need and they'll grow very fast. That's also a very cool thing, is that their brood development is amazing for such a relatively big, which is also relatively small, ant colony. So, keep them, if you can, because it'll be an amazing experience. Uh, also, you know, the walk inside their nest is amazing because they are active 24 7 in there. They are always moving around, always taking care of brood, because they keep a lot of brood. Especially while they haven't, you know, stopped growing their little, you know, number charts. When they haven't stopped growing, they will have a lot of brood to take care of, and they'll always be making more. So you will always have, you will always have a lot of activity inside the nest. Outside, they are primordially nocturnal, so you know, keep that in mind as well. So if you don't see a lot of activity during the day, it's completely normal. It's completely fine. What, what you want to see activity all the time is inside the nest. If you don't, something is wrong. Uh, probably humidity or temperature. Or maybe food, maybe they're starving, so take care of that. So, now you know everything you need to know to take care of this species, so if you do, do it well, and if you do, enjoy it. And tell me about it. Also, if you've enjoyed, if you've enjoyed the video, if this video has helped you in any way, or if you just enjoyed to listen to me talking because I'm not using pictures of anyone anymore except in a thumbnail, I'm so sorry about it. Uh, well, I'm not really. I need to make a thumbnail. I can just write something on PowerPoint, and I can, I can also not travel to Southeast Asia to take pictures. So sorry, not sorry. Sorry, sorry, not sorry. Um, share this video around. As always, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you. Bye-bye.